Continuing Plutarch's Lives, translated by John Dryden, revised by Arthur Hugh Clough. We are in our second program of Fabius, aren't we? Um, he resolved, therefore, with all the arts and subtleties of war, to break his measures and bring Fabius to an engagement, like a cunning wrestler, watching every opportunity to get good hold and close with his adversary. He at one time attacked and sought to distract his attention, tried to draw him off in various directions, and endeavored in all ways to tempt him from his safe policy. All this artifice, though it had no effect upon the firm judgment and conviction of the dictator, yet upon the common soldier, and even upon the general of the horse himself, it had too great an operation. Minuncius, unseasonably eager for action, bold and confident, humored the soldiery, and himself contributed to fill them with wild eagerness and empty hopes, which they vented in reproaches upon Fabius, calling him Hannibal's pedagogue, since he did nothing else but follow him up and down and wait upon him. At the same time, they cried up Minuncius for the only captain worthy to command the Romans, whose vanity and presumption rose so high in consequence that he instantly jested at Fabius's encampment upon the mountains, saying that he seated them there, as on a theater, to behold the flames and desolation of their country, and he would sometimes ask the friends of the general whether it were not his meaning by thus leading them from mountain to mountain, to carry them at last, having no hopes on earth, up into heaven, are to hide them in the clouds from Hannibal's army. When his friends reported these things to the dictator, persuading him that to avoid the general obloquy, he should make the enemy, that he should engage the enemy, his answer was, I should be more faint-hearted than they make me, if through fear of auto reproaches I should abandon my own convictions. It is no inglorious thing to have fear for the safety of our country, but to be turned from one's course by men's opinions, by blame, and by misrepresentation, shown a man unfit to hold an office such as this, which, by such conduct, he makes the slaves of those whose errors it is his business to control." An oversight of Hannibal occurred soon after, desirous to refresh his horse in some good pasture grounds and to draw off his army. He ordered his guides to conduct him to the district of Cassinum. They, mistaking his bad pronunciation, led him and his army to the town of Castellinum on the frontier of Campania, which the river Lathranus, called by the Romans, Volturnus, divides into two parts. The country around is enclosed by mountains, with a valley opening towards the sea, in which the river overflowing forms a quantity of marshland with deep banks of sand, and discharges itself into a, the sea on a very unsafe and rough shore. While Hannibal was proceeding hither, Fabius, by his knowledge of the roads, succeeding in making his way around before him, and dispatched four thousand choice men to seize the exit from it, and stop him up, and lodge the rest of his army upon the neighboring hills in the most advantageous places, at the same time dispatching a party of his lightest armed men to fall upon Hannibal's rear, which they did with such success that they cut off 800 of them and put the whole army in disorder. Hannibal, finding the error and the danger he was fallen into, immediately crucified the guides, but considered the enemy to be so advantageously posted that there was no hope of breaking through them, while his soldiers began to be disappointed and terrified and to think themselves surrounded with embarrassments too difficult to be surmounted. Now, 
let us remember that uh, the Romans were not the first to crucify. They were just, the, you know, m more known for it. And probably were the first to put it in a mass scale like that and just keep it up as part of their way. But um, thus reduced Hannibal had a recourse to stratagem. He caused 2,000 head of oxen, which he had in his camp, to have torches or dry faggots, you know, bundles of sticks, well fastened to their horns, and, lighting them in the beginning of the night, ordered the beasts to be driven on towards the heights, commanding the passages out of the valley and the enemy's posts. When this was done, he made his army in the dark, leisurely march after them. The, um, in India, there were rituals where people would carry fire. But, you know, that wasn't, this wasn't quite the purpose there, but, um, the oxen at first kept a slow, orderly pace, and, with their lighted heads, resemble an army marching by night, astonishing the shepherds and herdsmen of the hills about. But when the fire burnt down the horns of the beasts to the quick, they no longer observed their sober pace, but unruly and wild with their pain, ran dispersed about, tossing their heads and scattering the fire round about them upon each other, and setting light as they passed to the trees. This was a surprising spectacle to the Romans, on guard, upon the heights, seeing flames which appeared to come from men advancing with torches. They were possessed with the alarm that the enemy was approaching in various quarters, and that they were being surrounded, and, quitting their post, abandoned the pass, and precipitately retired to their camp on the hills. They were no sooner gone, but the light armed of Hannibal's men, according to his order, immediately seized the heights, and soon after the whole army, with all the baggage, came up and safely marched through the passes. Fabius, before the night was over, quickly found out the trick, for some of the beasts fell into his hands, but for fear of an ambush in the dark, he kept his men all night to their arms in the camp. As soon as it was day, he attacked the enemy in the rear, where, after a good deal of skirmishing in uneven ground, the disorder might have become general, but that Hannibal detached from his van a body of Spaniards, who, of themselves, active and nimble, were accustomed to the climbing of mountains. These briskly attacked the Roman troops, who were in heavy armor, killed a good many, and left Fabius no longer in condition to follow the enemy. This action brought the extreme of a blop and contempt to the dictator. They said it was now manifest that he was not only inferior to his adversary, as they had always thought in courage, but even in that conduct, foresight, and generalship by which he had proposed to bring the war to an end, and Hannibal, to enhance their anger against him, marched with his army close to the lands and possessions of Fabius, and giving orders to his soldiers to burn and destroy all the country about, forbade them to do the least damage in the estates of the Roman general, and place guards for their security. This, when reported to Rome, had the effect with the people, which Hannibal desired. Their tribunes raised a thousand stories against him, chiefly at the instigation of Metilius, who, not so much out of hatred to him as out of friendship to Minicius, whose kinsman he was, thought by depressing Fabius to raise his friend. The Senate, on their part, were also offended with him for the bargain he had made with Hannibal about the exchange of prisoners, the conditions of which were that, after the exchange, 
made of man for man. If any on either side remained, they should be redeemed at the price of two hundred and fifty drachmas a head. Upon the whole account, there remained two hundred and forty Romans unexchanged. And the Senate now not only refused to allow money for ransoms, but also reproached Fabius for making a contract contrary to the honor and interest of the commonwealth, for redeeming men whose cowardice had put them in the hands of the enemy. Well, that's not usually why they're captured, but... Um, Fabius heard and endured all this with invincible patience, and having no money by him, and on the other side being resolved to keep his word with Hannibal, and not to abandon the captives, he dispatched his son to Rome to sell land, and to bring with him the price, sufficient to discharge the ransoms, which was punctually performed by his son, and delivery, and delivery accordingly made to him of the prisoners, amongst whom many, when they were released, made proposals to repay the money, which Fabius in all cases declined. About this time, he was called to Rome by the priests to assist according to the duty of his office at certain sacrifices, and was thus forced to leave the command of the army with Minuncius, but before he parted, not only charged him as his commander-in-chief, but besought and entreated him not to come in his absence to a battle with Hannibal. His commands, entreaties, and advice were lost upon Minicius, for his back was no sooner turned, but the new general immediately sought occasions to attack the enemy, and notice being brought him that Hannibal had sent out a great part of his army to forage, he fell upon a detachment of the remainder, doing great execution and driving them to their very camp, with no little terror to the rest, who apprehended their breaking in upon them. And when Hannibal had recalled his scattered forces to the camp, he nevertheless, without any loss, made his retreat, a success which, aggra which aggravated his boldness and presumption, and filled the soldiers with rash confidence. The news spread to Rome, where Fabius, on being told it, he said that what he feared most was Minicius's success. But the people, highly elated, hurried to the forum, to listen to an address from Attilius, the tribune, in which he infinitely extolled the valor of Minicius, and fell bitterly upon Fabius, accusing him for want, not merely of courage, but even of loyalty, and not only him, but also many other eminent and considerable persons, saying that it was they that had brought the Carthaginians into Italy, with the design to destroy the liberty of the people for which end they had at once put the supreme authority into the hands of a single person who by a slowness and delays might give Hannibal leisure to establish himself in Italy and the people of Carthage time and opportunity to supply him with fresh succors to complete his conquest. Now, Carthage and Carthaginians is the more modern pronunciation, and I, I'm well aware of that, but they didn't pronounce the G as the J when this book was written. So, well, I mean, when the... What's being translated, right? Um, Fabius came forward with no intention to answer the tribune. But only said that they should expedite the sacrifices, that so he might speedily return to the army to punish Inicius, who had presumed to fight contrary to his orders, words which immediately possessed the people with the belief that Inicius stood in danger of his life, for it was in the power of the dictator to imprison and to put to death and they feared that Fabius, of a mild temper in general, would be as hard as he appeased when once irritated, as he was slow to be provoked. 
nobody dared to raise his voice in opposition. Metilius alone, whose office of tribune gave him security to say what he pleased for in the time of a dictatorship, that magistratial one preserves his authority, boldly applied himself to the people in the behalf of Minicus, that they should not suffer him to be made a sacrifice to the enmity of Fabius, nor permit him to be destroyed like the son of Manlius Torquatus, who was beheaded by his father for a victory fought and triumphantly won against order. He exhorted them to take away from Fabius that absolute power of a dictator and to put it into more worthy hands. Or well, perhaps put some limits on it next time, right? Uh, better able and more inclined to use it for the public good. These impressions very much prevailed upon the people, though not so far as wholly to dispose Fabius of the dictatorship. But they decreed that, that Minicius should have an equal authority with the dictator in the conduct of the war, which was a thing then without precedent though a little later it was again practiced after the disaster at Cana, when the dictator Marcus Junius being with the army, they chose at Rome Fabius Batao, dictator, that he might create new senators to supply the numerous places of those who were killed, but as soon as, once acting in public, he had filled those vacant places with a sufficient number, he immediately dismissed his lictors, and withdrew from all his attendants, and mingling like a common person with the rest of the people, quietly went about his own affairs in the forum. The enemies of Fabius thought they had sufficiently humiliated and subdued him by raising Minicius to be his equal in authority, but they mistook the temper of the man, who looked upon their folly as not his loss, but like Diogenes, who, being told that some persons derided him, made answer, but I am not derided, meaning that only those were really insulted on whom such insults made an impression. So Fabius, with great tranquility and unconcern, submitted to what happened, and contributed a proof to the argument of the philosophers, that a just and good man is not capable of being dishonored. His only vexation arose from his fear, lest this ill counsel by supplying opportunities to the diseased military ambition of his subordinate should damage the public cause, lest the rashness of Midicius should now at once run headlong into some disaster, he returned back with all privacy and sped to the army, where he found Midicius so elevated with his new dignity that a joint authority not contenting him, he required by turns to have the command of the army every other day. This Fabius rejected, but was contented that the army should be divided, thinking each general singly would better command his part than partly command the whole. The first and fourth legion he took for his own division, the second and third he delivered to Minicius. So also of the auxiliary forces, each had an equal share. Minicius, thus exalted, could not contain himself from boasting of his success in humiliating, in humiliating the high and powerful office of the dictatorship. Fabius quietly reminded him that it was, in all wisdom, Hannibal and not Fabius who had to combat. But if he must needs contend with his colleague, it had best be in diligence and care for the preservation of Rome, that it might not be said a man so favored by the people served them worse than he who had been ill-treated and disgraced by them. The young general, despising these admonitions as the false humility of age, immediately removed with the body of his army and encamped by himself. Hannibal, who was not ignorant of all these passages, lay watching his advantage from them. It happened that between his army and that of Minicius there was a certain eminence which seemed a very advantageous and not difficult post to encamp upon. The level field around it appeared, from a distance, to be all smooth and even. 
uh, to be all smooth and even, though it had many inconsiderable ditches and dips in it, not concernable to the eye of Hannibal. Had he pleased, could easily have possessed himself of the ground, but he had reserved it for the bait or train at a proper season to draw the Romans to an engagement. Now that Minichius and Fabius were divided, he thought the opportunity fair for his purpose, and therefore having the night time lodged in a convenient number of his men in these ditches and hollow places early in the morning, he sent forth a small detachment who, in the sight of Minichius, proceeded to possess themselves of the rising ground. According to his expectation, Minichius swallowed the bait, and first sends out his light troops, and after them some horse to dislodge the enemy. And at last, when he saw Hannibal in a person advancing to the assistance of his men, marched down with his whole army drawn up, he engaged with the troops on the eminence and sustained their missiles. The combat for some time was equal, but as soon as Hannibal perceived that the whole army was now sufficiently advanced within the toils he had sent that he had set for them, so that their backs were open to his men, whom he had posted in the hollows, he gave the signal upon which they rushed forth from various quarters, and with loud cries furiously attacked Minucius in the rear. The surprise and the slaughter was great and struck universal alarm and disorder throughout the whole army. Minichius himself lost all his confidence, and looked from officer to officer, and found all alike unprepared to face the danger, and yielding to a flight, which, however, could not end in safety. The Namedian horsemen were already in full victory, riding about the plain, cutting down the fugitives. Fabius was not ignorant of this danger of his countrymen. He foresaw what would happen from the rashness of Minucius and the cunning of Hannibal, and therefore kept his men to their arms in readiness to wait the event. Nor would he trust to the reports of others, but he himself, in the front of his camp, viewed all that passed when, therefore, he saw the army of Medicius encompassed by the enemy, and that, by their countenance and shifting the ground, they appeared more disposed to flight than to resistance. With a great sigh, striking his hand upon his thigh, he said to those about him, O Hercules, how much sooner than I expected! Though later than he seemed to desire, hath Minichius destroyed himself. He then commanded the ensigns to be led forward, and the army to follow, telling them, We must make haste to rescue Minichius, who is a valiant man and a lover of his country. And if he hath been too forward to engage the enemy at another time, we will tell him of it. Thus, at the head of his men, Fabius marched up to the enemy, and first cleared the plain of the Numidians, and next fell upon those that were charging the Romans in the rear, cutting down all that made opposition, and obliging the rest to save themselves by hasty retreat, lest they should be environed as the Romans had been. Hannibal, seeing so sudden a change of affairs, and Fabius, beyond the force of his age, opening his way through the ranks up the hillside, that he might join Minichius, warily forbore, sounded a retreat, and drew off his men into their camps. While the Romans, on their part, were no less contented to retire in safety, it is reported that, upon this occasion, Hannibal said, jestingly to his friends, Did I not tell you that this cloud, which always hovered, upon the mountains would, at some time or other, come down with a storm upon us. And, as a side note, you see behind me the uh, green, black, and white flag is the ensigns of this temple. And, um, move that light. Um, Fabius 
after his men had picked up the spoils of the field, retired to his own camp, without saying any harsh or reproachful thing to his colleague, who also in his part, gathering his army together, spoke and said to them, to conduct great matters, and never commit a fault, is above the force of human nature, but to learn and improve by the faults we have committed, is that which becomes a good and sensible man. Some reasons I have to accuse fortune, but I have many more to thank her, for in a few hours she hath cured a long mistake, and taught me that I am not the man who should command others, but have need of another to command me, and that we are not to contend for victory over those who, to whom it is our advantage to yield. Therefore, in everything else, henceforth the dictator must be your commander. Only in showing gratitude towards him, I will still be your leader, and always be the first to obey his orders. Having said this, he commanded the Roman eagles to move forward, and all his men to follow him to the camp of Fabius. The soldiers then, as he entered, stood amazed at the novelty of the sight, and were anxious and doubtful what the meaning might be. When he came near the dictator's tent, Fabius went forth to meet him, on which he at once laid his standards at his feet, calling him with a loud voice his father, while the soldiers with him saluted the soldiers here as their patrons, the term employed by the freedmen to those who gave them their liberty. After silence was obtained, Minichius said, you have this day, O dictator, obtained two victories, one by your valor and conduct over Hannibal, and another by your wisdom and goodness over your colleague. By one victory you preserved, and by the other instructed us, and when we were already suffering, one shameful defeat from Hannibal by another. Welcome one from you, and we were restored to honor and safety. I can address you by no nobler name than that of a kind father though a father's beneficence falls short of that I have received from you. From a father I individually received the gift of life. To you I owe its preservation, not for myself only, but for all those who are under me. After this, he threw himself into the arms of the dictator, and in the same manner the soldiers of each army embraced one another with gladness and tears of joy. Um, I've heard of individuals and battle, you could say, that, uh, you know, before or after, they're like, well, nothing personal is, you know, you know, just the sides we picked, right? Um, not long after, Fabius laid down the dictatorship, and consuls were again created. Those who immediately succeeded observed the same method in managing the war and avoiding all occasions of fighting Hannibal in a pitched battle. They only scored their allies and preserved the towns from falling off to the enemy. But afterwards, when Terentius Varro, a man of obscure birth, but very popular and bold, had obtained the consulship, he soon made it appear that by his rashness and ignorance he would stake the whole commonwealth on the hazard, for it was his custom to declaim in all assemblies that as long as Rome employed generals like Fabius, there never would be an end of the war, vaunting that Whenever he should get sight of the enemy, he would that same day free Italy from the strangers. With these promises, he so prevailed that he raised a greater army than ever had been sent out of Rome. There were enlisted 88,000 fighting men, but what gave confidence to the populace only terrified the wise and experienced, and none more than Fabius, since if so great a body and the flower of the Roman youth should be cut off, they could not see any new resource for the safety of Rome. They addressed themselves, therefore, to the other council. Anelius Paulus, a man of great experience in war, but unpopular, and a fearful also of the populace, who at once before, upon some impeachment, condemned him, so that he needed encouragement to withstand his colleagues. Temerity, Fabius told him, if he would profitably service his country. He must no less oppose Varro's ignorant eagerness that Hannibal's conscious readiness, since both alike conspired to decide the fate of Rome by a battle. It is more reasonable, he said to him, 
that you should believe me than borrow in matters relating to Hannibal, when I tell you that if for this year you abstain from fighting with him, either his army will perish of itself, or else he will be glad to depart of his own free will. This evidently appears, insomuch as, notwithstanding his victories, none of the countries or towns of Italy come into him, and his army is not now the third part of what it was at first. To this, Paulus is said to have replied, Did I only consider myself? I should rather choose to be exposed to the weapons of Hannibal than once more to his suffrages of my fellow citizens. Again, rumbling the tumbling, because it's typically the time of day to eat, right? Um, who are urgent for what you disapprove, since, yet since the cause of Rome is at stake, I will rather seek in my conduct to please and obey Fabius than all the world besides. These good measures were defeated by the importunity of Varro, whom, when they were both come into the army, nothing would content but a separate command that each consul should have his day. And, when his turn came, he posted his army close to Hannibal, at a village called Cana by the river Alphidus. It was no sooner day, but he set up the scarlet coat, flying over his tent, which was the sign of battle. This boldness of the consul and the numerousness of his army double theirs startled the Carthaginians. But Hannibal commanded them to their arms, and with a small train rode out to take full prospect of the enemy, as they were now forming in their ranks, from a rising ground not far distant. One of his followers, called Gisco, a Carthaginian of equal rank with himself, told him that the numbers of the enemy were astonishing, to which Hannibal replied with a serious countenance, There is one thing, Gisco, yet more astonishing, which you take no notice of. And when Gisco inquired what answered that in all those great numbers before us there is not one man called Gisco. This unexpected jest of their general made all the company laugh, and as they came down from the hill they told it to those whom they met, which caused a general laughter amongst them, from which they were hardly able to recover themselves.